well. So uh, uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to move to the subject for this week. Uh, and there will probably be another half lecture uh, on this uh, the following week. So we are roughly about uh, half a lecture behind schedule at the moment. And uh, what I want to do today is talk to you about uh, the position of women in Indian society, in, in contemporary India. Um, the arguments that are going to be made uh, today uh, by and large apply to women across all of South Asia. Um, it has been very often argued that whatever arguments one might make about the position of women in Indian society, that in some respects uh, the uh, position of women in Pakistan and uh, Bangladesh uh, is even worse. Uh, we're not here to really make a relative assessment of uh, whether their position is worse or better, uh, but the point here is that the examples are being taken from India, but certainly with respect to many of these kinds of issues that we're going to talk about, the examples could easily have been taken uh, from Pakistan as well. There are certain phenomena that are more commonly encountered in uh, Pakistan. You, uh, notice the word I used, encountered, not practiced, because if you say practiced, then that suggests that there might be an old history to it, such as there's been a problem that has been quite visible for the last 20 years, uh, particularly in Pakistan. It's called honor killings. So let's say a Muslim woman, um, you know, marries, uh, and here we're not talking marrying outside our caste. Remember, we're talking about India, uh, about Pakistan here, not India. Uh, but let's say a, a woman, uh, you know, a Muslim woman who uh, has an alliance with a Muslim male from a very different class background, or very different ethnic background, or linguistic background, or let's say that she is a Shia and he is a Sunni. Uh, so you get this problem of what is called honor killings. Uh, it's been, uh, I wouldn't say, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's an epidemic or anything of that kind, but it's a problem that's been encountered in Pakistan. It's been encountered much less frequently in India, but we, as we'll see, we have enough of these, of similar kinds of problems in India itself. However, the history of women in South Asia in the post-independent period should not be reduced to a history of the problems they have. Uh, I hope we won't make that mistake, just as I hope that we won't make a mistake of assuming that when we talk about Hindu, Hindus and Muslims in India, that we immediately think that the only thing to talk about is communalism, right? Uh, Hindu-Muslim differences and how these lead to protracted episodes of violence, because for the most part, as I suggested to you, it's very clear uh, that uh, Hindus and Muslims in India have been able to forge a certain kind of cultural synthesis, right? And that cultural synthesis has been around for a long time. At some points, it's under more stress and tension than it is at other points, right? But we cannot reduce the history of Hindu-Muslim relations uh, you know, in India to a history of communal violence. And similarly, we cannot reduce a history of women in South Asia. You know, what might have been some of the achievements? What is their place in the film industry, for example? Uh, women writers, uh, and there are plenty of them, plenty of them, right? Uh, so, but we can't obviously take all of those segments and try to, because we'd have to do a course on women in South Asia itself. And what we're doing here is we are focusing really on a number of problems that uh, are peculiar to women, are particular to women, that is that women are more likely to be afflicted by these problems. In some cases, only they will be afflicted by these problems. Although, given the nature of social relations, it's very clear that problems that afflict only women in, per in particular will obviously have some consequences for members of the family, and that could include male members of the family, and so on. But before we move into that, let me try to give you a little capsule account of some of the key issues from the 19th century onwards, OK? Um, and here again, this is going to be a capsule history, but some of this you have to sort of try to bear in mind uh, in order to understand some of the issues that we're going to bring up uh, for the last 20, 25 years. Now, in the 19th century, 18th, 19th centuries, uh, as has been mentioned on numerous occasions, and as you all know by now, I mean, India is under colonial rule. Uh, and if you look at this first half of the 19th century, the British pointed to a large number of problems in Indian society that they thought needed to be, let me use a colloquialism, fixed, okay? That they thought needed to be fixed. If you look at the list of problems 
that they describe, which they say are plaguing India, okay, are plaguing India in the early 19th century, you'll find that the majority of these problems have to do with the status of women. Okay, the majority of them. What would be a list of them if I ran down the list very quickly? Let's begin with sati. Okay, what is sati? It's the practice of widow immolation. Um, and you might say, well, that doesn't seem to be much more illuminating than saying the word sati. What the hell is widow immolation? Right? And uh, what does this practice amount to? So what it amounts to is uh, a woman who loses her husband on whatever account, either of old age or a snake bite, you know, or poison, right? That if this woman is a true sati, sati has two meanings. I mean, in the West, they only think of one meaning because they only know one meaning, and sati, the meaning they know here is the act of widow immolation. But sati actually also refers to the woman who commits that act of widow immolation, for your information, okay? So you say this woman is a sati, right? Uh, or wo is a sati because you might say that's grammatically incorrect because if she is dead, well, she no longer is. But the point is that she is immortal, right? That's partly the ideology of sati. But to keep it simpler for you, what widow immolation means, a woman loses her husband, she jumps into the funeral pyre. Remember, in, in, in Hindu families, you burn the dead, not bury. That's one big difference between Hinduism and Islam. People have made a lot of it, you know, how you treat your dead. So uh, you burn the dead, so there's a funeral pyre, a cremation going on, and, and then she is, jumps into it. And this is supposed to be illustrative of her ability to sacrifice herself, of her love for her husband, and so on. Now, there are a huge number of questions, none of which we can really take up, uh, because sati was a phenomenon most widely written about, although as a phenomenon, it's also least, the least encountered one. But obviously, it's the most exotic one, right? I mean, what if you had to say, if you were British and you had to say, ah, this is what illustrates the difference between us and them, nothing illustrated it better from their point of view than sati, right? Because the problem is, if you're trying to say, okay, these people are radically different from us, right? And you say, oh, well, what are the illustrations of that? And somebody says, well, they don't educate their women too well. Well, in 19th century England, I have to tell you, they didn't educate women either, okay? So that's not going to work very well. If you say, well, they beat their women. Well, that was pretty habitual. It still is in many places in the world, right? I mean, domestic violence, for example, right? So you see, for every problem you found in Indian society, somebody might say, ah, but that problem has its analog in the West as well. So why is it that we should use this problem to say that these people are particularly backward or wicked, right, or need our civilizing, right, influence on us? Because remember, the whole logic here is that the English are saying, well, we need to civilize these people, right? But in Sati, they find it. They say, ah, this is something that is radically different. So the number of incidents of sati is relatively small. And in fact, actually, the phenomenon is only encountered in a very small number of communities, particularly in Bengal, it was encountered. It was encountered in Rajasthan in a different form. But you wouldn't encounter it in Tamil Nadu or Karnataka or Kerala, not at all. Right? But the huge literature develops around the issue of sati because it becomes a marker of difference, right? So sati, so the list of problems that you encounter in Indian civilization that need to be fixed is sati. In other words, you need to have legislation to abolish sati. And indeed, in 1835, the British passed legislation uh, abolishing sati in British India, in British India, right? Uh, what would be the other problems that you need to arrest, need to correct? Female infanticide. Very different, right? Where which is something I've talked about in a different context before in this class where, you know, children, and that could have several different meanings, female infanticide meaning, actually literally here, meaning that very young children, girls, are killed when they're infants, and they may be killed for various reasons, right? And they may be killed for various reasons because they are the most expendable at that point in time, let's say an area struck by famine or drought, right? So what do you do? You basically kill 
you kill those who are the most expendable for whatever reason, okay, right? But female infanticide is a broader category that I'm using here to also refer to abortion, uh, particularly of female uh, uh, fetuses, right? And so forth and so on, right? Uh, female infanticide does not include neglect of children, particularly female children. So that would be another third objection that the British would have raised. What would be a fourth example? For example, the fact that women and girls were not educated, okay, certainly in comparison to males, right? So I'm giving you an illustration. The British are saying these are all the kinds of problems that you encounter in India, and this justifies our presence here because we can help to eliminate them because this civilization will not eliminate these problems itself, right? And you've, you've encountered similar versions of this argument even today, you know, when the United States moves into a country and says, well, we're going to try to fix this country. Okay. I mean, similar kind of arguments are going to be raised there as well. I mean, Afghanistan is backward, right? I mean, you've heard this. It's in the New York Times every day. The women wail. They don't go to school, right? We need to do something about it, right? But in the 19th century, we need to do something about it. There was no hesitancy or moral compunction. You were already there. You simply did what you thought you had to do, okay? Now, let's extrapolate from that to the theoretical argument. The theoretical argument is the following. Namely, we have to, we do that even today. And if you remember my discussion of development, you will now recall the discussion in this context. What we do is we evaluate countries in relation to each other. So, you know, you have this thing called UNDP. You know what UNDP is for those of you in development studies, you, you, right? United Nations Development Program. And they issue an index, okay? And this index basically ranks country, countries according to how developed they are, according to how developed they are. Then they use various criteria for what it means to be developed, right? So one of the biggest criteria that they would use is literacy. What percentage of the population is literate? Which is, in my view, again, I've already explained that to you, that I find that to be completely unacceptable for various reasons, right? Because we could obviously say, well, if a country is 95% literate, uh, right, and yet nobody or very few people in that country object to that country waging a war on another country, then what's the point of being literate, you could say, right? right? So we'd have to really say, what exactly does literacy mean? And we're not going to be able to resolve that question immediately, right? But I'm just saying, this is a criteria that is used. GNP is going to be used. Infant mortality rate, maternal mortality rate, number of hospital beds per 100,000 people, okay, in the population. They're all these, these are all these kinds of indices that you use, and you rank the countries. India is way down, you know, along with countries such as Namibia and Ghana, you know, countries that it would rather not be down with, but that's where it is, okay, in the UNDP index, okay? Now, the important point is this. This is where we get to the theoretical point. I'm saying that this impulse to evaluate, okay, in the 19th century, it was very clear. You didn't use literacy, and you didn't use literacy for large number of reasons. A, there was no way to measure it, okay, as there is now, that there's a way of measuring literacy in some sense of the term. Or you didn't have the census, for example, okay, in most countries of the world. So how would you measure, right? What you did was you said, we are going to evaluate civilizations according to how they treat their women. This is the implicit criteria that is used. Implicit criteria that is used. Of course, if they use this criteria, then England will say, and England is colonizing India, that we are number one, we treat our women much better, right? And India is, you know, way down 100 somewhere, right? And it, why? Because India treats its women very badly. How do we know that? Female infanticide, sati, low rate of education for girls, etc., etc. You see what I'm talking about here, right? That this history of evaluating and so forth has old, it's old history. What has changed only marginally is that we have added the number of criteria that we use now. But I think that in the back of the minds of most people, we still accept this criteria that you evaluate a country or a civilization, it claims to be civilized by how it treats its women, okay? I mean, at least it looks good if you evaluate it that way. You can say that we're being progressive, all of the kinds of facades that you find in modernity, right? 
you know, we're being progressive, look, you know, we, we think of women so highly, etc., etc. So, right, and so the big justification for doing something about Afghanistan is Afghanistan treats its women like hell, right? I mean, that you read that in the newspapers every day, right? And you don't have to go to Bill O'Reilly, I mean, even go to a liberal newspaper and they'll say exactly the same thing, okay? So this is the situation you have to keep in mind because we have to try to understand why was there such an obsession with issues related to women, because after all, there are problems that afflict everybody. I mean, if you don't have access to safe drinking water, you don't have access to it, whether you're male, female, 10 years old, or 60 years old, or whether you're a Brahmin or Shudra, or whatever, if you don't have access to it at all. I mean, obviously, some people will have more access than others, a problem we have talked about often enough in this class, that you do have an unequal, unequal use of resources and availability of them, right? But I'm saying that, that, uh, for example, uh, medical well-being, well-being in the medical sense, is a problem that is a problem that would have affected everybody, given the generally poor levels of sanitation, nutrition, and hygiene that you found in the 19th century and which you still find in large parts of India, right? But it, it, we will understand better why so much of the social literature focuses on women if we understand the theoretical argument I've made for you now, namely that the status of women became the principal criteria implicitly by which you ranked countries in relationship to each other, and this status and this criteria still remains down to the present days. Okay, that's point number one. Point number two, if you move into the 20th century now, so we have to say, all right, what was the role of women in the public sphere? Okay, now, okay, there are these problems, um, and we haven't talked about what was done to ameliorate those problems yet, okay? But, you know, can we say, I mean, the typical representation would have been that women were leading lives of seclusion. And lives of seclusion means the domestic sphere, which, incidentally, again, I mean, if you do American history, it's not radically different here. I mean, for those of you who have studied American history and you know about uh, what happened in World War II, you know that there were a large number of women who went into the workforce during World War II. The men were out fighting, right? And there are women who are working in the munitions industries, defense industries, right? Huge number of American women enter into the labor force at that time during World War II. But after the war ended and the men came back, what do you think happened to the women? Do you think they continued on? No. The vast majority of them went back to their homes, to their suburban homes or wherever it was, okay, to lead, again, lives of domesticity for the most part, right? So this, this distinction about who occupies the public space, okay, whether men occupy it in women, to what extent women, this is a question that you find in every society. And I'm, I'm giving you the American example because we have to always make an endeavor to do simultaneously two things. One, to say what is particular to India, but at the same time, secondly, to recognize that certain kinds of problems, certain kinds of conditions, certain kinds of questions are in fact common, are generic. Right? And it seems to me that this is where we have to be very careful how we draw the line between the two. Because if we say that all of these problems, conditions, problems are specific to India, then we begin to exoticize the place in some sense. And I think that we have to be extremely cautious and wary about doing that, okay? Right? But nonetheless, now let's go back to the Indian case here. So in the 20th century, in view of the fact that India was very distinct in one particular way, and that was that India, of all the countries in the world, had what you might describe justly as a nonviolent revolution. And yes, there is a lot of debate about that, critique of that, to what extent Gandhi was widely followed by everybody. Were there not other revolutionaries who did not agree with Gandhi? Yes, there were. But there's no question whatsoever that this is what distinguishes <coughs> India in some respects from every other place. If you're looking at the first half of the 20th century, right, that you find that India had a, what you might describe as a nonviolent revolution against colonial rule. And one of the aspects of that nonviolent revolution, which is critical for our understanding, and I think to some extent explains why 
there are large number of Indian women today who in fact have moved into the professions, for example, okay, right? Um, in a way that has not been seen in any other country. For example, you will be surprised to hear that as a percentage, of course in numbers, India's, the, the, the figures from India would be much greater because the population is much greater. <coughs> I'm talking about as a percentage. The percentage of women scientists and engineers in India is greater than it is in the United States. Much greater. Okay? Right? And how is that possible? So in order to understand that in part, what you have to do is you have to go back to the 1920s, 1930s, because one of the aspects of the Gandhi movement was the fact that it brought women out into the public sphere for various reasons, which we cannot at this point go into. Women felt a lot more comfortable being part of a nonviolent revolution. So you find enhanced participation of women in the public sphere. And again, one can draw distinctions. What, what exactly was the nature of their participation in the public sphere, one could say, for example. But if you look at some of the nonviolent movements of resistance led by Gandhi in opposition to the British, we find that there are a large number of women. And in fact, actually, it surprised some people because they were accustomed to seeing women in seclusion. And when I say seclusion here, I don't mean that all of them were veiled, but women were not really part of the public sphere. Just as if you go to Indian cities today, I think that it, what I, the public sphere is what I would describe as a predominantly male public sphere in some ways. But there are different kinds of public spheres. So if you go to the, what is called the pan shop, many of you here will not know what a pan shop is, but pan is this uh, uh, beetle leaf. Okay, uh, wh what is beetle leaf? Then somebody will say, you know, it's, it's not like something you consume every day over here, right? So it's it's a substance uh, comes from a tree. Uh, the arachia nut is the the English translation, and you basically it has intoxicating effects, uh, and you can p make it as a powder or you can mix it into a leaf. Okay, and that becomes a pan. So there's a shop, and it's called a pan shop. Everybody who's been to South Asia knows what a pan shop is. Okay, well, the pan shop, women do not hang around pan shops. Let me put it to you this way, simply. Okay, that's an example of a predominantly public sphere. But the public sphere is, here that I'm speaking about is a much larger public sphere. It's a sphere of print, media, demonstrations, right? Because one way to write the history of the 19th century is the idea of emerging public spheres all over the world. That is a number of people who are part of what you might describe as a public that is now active. This number of people continues to grow. The masses are coming into politics in various ways. And women are coming into the public sphere in various ways, which means they're entering into professions. In the 1920s, what it means is they're entering into politics. All right? They are leaving their homes. And if you read the autobiographies of middle class women, middle class Indian women, right, written in the 50s, 60s, talking about what they were like when they were growing up in the early 1920s, you find that many of them will tell you that they were the first women in the family who really went out of the home and said, well, I'm going to have a life outside the home. That's what it means to move into the public sphere too. This is happening in the 1920s, 1920s, 1930s. And I'm saying that the entry of women into the public sphere in India today, the history of that goes back to the 20s and 30s. OK? So these, so two things we have talked about. One, using women as a kind of an index to evaluate the status of a civilization. And secondly, the entry of women into the public sphere in India beginning in the first half of the 20th century. And then the third point, which is related to the second point, is the emergence of what you might describe as a women's movement. And so what does the emergence of a women's movement do? It's not something that emerges only in the last 20, 30 years, contrary to public understanding of it. You know, we know from the work that has been done that you can think about something called a women's movement in India going back already to the 1920s. Because these same women, some of these women who came into the public sphere, then also recognized that, well, yes, there are certain problems that are peculiar to women or that afflict women more than they afflict men, okay? Uh, right? And at this point in the 1920s, nobody in the women's movement is talking about domestic violence, for example, right? Neither is anybody doing that, by the way, in the U.S. 
or England. Domestic violence is an issue that only comes up in the 1960s, 1970s for the first time, even in the West for the most part. Right? But what they are talking about in the 1920s already, the women's movement, is if you have women, women moving into the public sphere, that means that some of them are now also going to move into the professions. They're going to start taking up paid employment. Right? Then you have to start thinking about issues that nobody had thought about before. Every country has had to think about those issues. What happens when mo women move into the public sphere and start to take up paid employment? Right? Because, for example, the category of sexual harassment at the workplace, you wouldn't have had to think about it 100 years ago. right? for obvious reasons. There are no women in the workplace in that sense of the term. So the question of sexual harassment and then the question of equality, the question of protection, privacy, all of these have to come into place before a category called sexual harassment can be recognized in the law. Because even, by the way, just simply saying sexual harassment, if it's not a category understood and recognized by the law, it has no meaning, right? Except morally, it may have a meaning, but in terms of enforcing right, some kind of strictures against sexual <laughs> harassment, saying that they have to, you know, that this is where it becomes sexual harassment, then you need a whole body of legislation to take care of that set of problems. All right? So you see, what I'm doing is I'm setting up the discussion. I'm saying to you that you have to keep all of this in mind. And the third element that I've added here is I'm suggesting to you that when these women come in, they are going to start embracing certain kinds of causes. Okay? Some of them particular to women, some of them not particular to women. So if there are women who, activists who are involved in saying, well, food is a problem, all right? accessibility to food is a problem, hunger is a problem, right? they're not speaking only about the accessibility of food that women have. The accessibility of food that women have might be a greater problem because their accessibility might be less than the accessibility of men. But, but some women recognize that there are problems, women activists recognize that there are problems which are generic, which move across society, across classes, and so on. All right? That's the scenario you need to keep in mind. Now let's move into the post-independent period. Okay? Uh, and again, it's going to be impossible to go over all of the issues. So what we have to do is we have to focus on a couple of things, just so that you get an idea of how some of these issues were dealt with. Let us first deal with the question of dowry murders. Okay, and you know what? What are dowry murders? Um, if you looked at Indian newspapers, I, I did a huge paper which I never published actually because the literature was moving so fast. And unless you were really working specifically on something like this, uh, it was hard to keep up with what the literature itself. Uh, but what what is the question of dowry murder here? Now, in the 1980s, if you look at Indian newspapers such as Times of India, Hindustan Times, Indian Express, daily newspapers in English, somewhere on page three, if it's an eight-column newspaper, okay, somewhere on page three, on column six, you would find about ten lines, right? So this is a huge paper, and buried in the middle of this, okay, would be a little small item, and the small item would say, "Woman dies while cooking at the stove," literally. That's the title. And the problem was that a woman dies cooking at the stove because she's using a kerosene stove. Okay, um, you know, you're not, there's no piped gas or anything of that kind coming into kitchens. You know, at that time. In fact, even today, except in Bombay and parts of Delhi, you don't have piped gas, so you you have to buy these gas cylinders. They're called. You know. Okay. Um, so she's cooking at a stove. Uh, and her garment catches fire, her sari catches fire, and she's burned to death. And now an accident can take place. The only problem here is that this particular kind of accident began to take place much too frequently, much too frequently. And, and of course, somebody who's reading the newspapers every day and who's got half a head and who's in, you know, interested in social problems begins to think, is there a pattern here? Is there a phenomenon here? And what the phenomenon here is, is that there are women who are being burned to death. Okay? They're being burned to death and it's being disguised as an accident. Right? Yes? Oh, I wasn't talking about dow dowry murders. I was talking about honor killings. That's completely... 
No, no, no. I, didn't, I, I never mentioned dowry murders. I'm, I said honor killings in Pakistan. Would you get yeah. That later? No, no, because you know we we won't be able to take all of them. You see, that's the problem. Each of them would require too much analysis. So <laughs> we're going to take one pinpoint one case here, you which is. This I, I, I would, yeah. I mean, if you, because you, you don't know the numbers, right? I mean, I have to tell you the numbers. So in the 1980s, I'm not going to give you the exact numbers. I have them here, but we don't need to jot them down. Roughly, let's say 5,000 deaths every year. 5,000. Okay. Now, those are 5,000 that are reported. There may be many more that are not reported. Right? And there's been a lot of discussion, huge amounts of discussion on well, whether even those 5,000, how do we actually determine how, you know, that all are related to dowry or not? And the only way to determine it uh, is to do a police investigation, okay, to do a police investigation. The problem here is doing a police investigation means you have to rely upon the truthfulness of the police, which in India is a hazardous thing to do, if I may put it this way, okay? Uh, I think it's hazardous to do it anyway, but certainly in India, it, absolutely hazardous to do it, okay? Uh, so, but let's leave that aside for a moment. So what does a dowry murder here mean? It means that, and because what's the profile of the victim here? The profile is young, married woman, married. Young, married woman, usually no more than three years into her marriage. Usually no more than three years into a marriage, right? And what is accounting for her death? What's accounting for her death is, so she gets married, and her husband, uh, before the marriage, uh, the, husband's fa uh, the husband or the husband's family demands a dowry. All right? Now, let us for a minute leave aside a dowry murder, because I have to tell you what dowry means now. Okay? And whether the practice of, institution, whether the practice of dowry was as widespread in India, let's say 100 years ago, as it is today. Right? And that's important to demonstrate because one of the things I'm going to try to argue to you, and this is my interpretation here, obviously, is that, so, that I don't believe that these are all age-old problems. That is, that somebody will come along and say, someone who doesn't really know, it seems to me, the problem, but here's about say, you know, hasn't this kind of thing been occurring in India for forever? I mean, haven't you always treated your women that way? You know? You'll see that <coughs> allegation, insinuation all the time. It's like if a conflict is taking place in Africa, I immediately the New York Times will tell you they've been fighting each other, God knows for how long, you know, for reasons that we don't understand. Well, a lot of these conflicts are very modern. They haven't been going on forever. Sorry. Right? And so this is what we this is why it's going to be important to understand. So leave this aside for a second now. Dowry murders, we get back to it. We have to first go to dowry here. And this is where you look at this part of the board. So what does dowry mean? Very simply what it means. I mean, the Sanskrit word for it, by the way, category, uh, is actually kanya dan. Okay? And you'll see now we're getting into a very complicated set of questions. When a woman gets married uh, 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 in this society, you describe it as kanya dan. Kanya means girl. Literally, it means an unmarried or virgin girl, unmarried. Dan is gift. Okay? So, uh, a marriage is a act of kanya dan, because the girl leaves her natal home, her birth home, and goes to the husband's family. So, this is what that, this is what the arrow here means. Woman going to the male's family. That's what it means. Woman is going to the male. Right? Which is, again, the norm in most societies that we know around the world, when a woman gets married, right, insofar as she is not simply setting up a nuclear family, which is a recent invention, because usually you would have joint families, she goes and stays with her husband's family. The husband does not come and stay with her family, right? That's the norm, right? So woman goes to the male, okay? And what we're saying now is that this is what Kanyadan is, that the woman gets married, it's the, it's the gift of the girl to the husband's family. Now, when a woman got married, she, there were certain things that were given to her. Originally, the idea of dowry, that's what's called a dowry, okay? Right? So, originally, a dowry was given to a woman, okay, 
That is, it was given to a woman by her family for her to give to her husband's family. Okay? So it's something that the woman takes with her to her husband's family. Originally, the idea of dowry was you give things that allow the woman to set up a home with her husband. For example, I'll take my own family's example. All right? I mean, when my mother got, because I've talked to my mother about what she got for her dowry, for example. Okay. Right? So when my mother got married, you know, so she uh, uh, has to give a dowry. Uh, and that means that her parents or my maternal grandparents purchase things for her that she would then take to her husband's family. And the idea of taking those things was that she would need those things in order to set up a house. And what would those things be? It would include a bed, right, pots and pans, right? That's what you gave in a traditional dowry, okay? In a traditional dowry, that's what you would give. There was also a part of the dowry that the woman kept for herself. Anybody here knows what that is? Jewelry, jewelry. I mean, you ever go to the Indian neighborhoods here and just see the number of jewelry shops, by the way? I mean, every second Indian shop is a jewelry shop, okay? It's an integral part of the dowry, okay? You take, the jewelry is given to the woman and she's, this is what she's supposed to keep for herself, not give to her husband's family, by the way. But that was part of the dowry, okay? Now, uh, and this is what I mean by the hair by so you let's complete this end of the picture here. Woman's goods, goods meaning things here, okay, going to the males, going to the, so both things are going in the same direction. The woman and the stuff that she has are all going to her husband's home. Now, dowry was practiced by the Brahmins, by the upper castes in India, not by the lower castes. It was practiced by the upper castes. The reason it was practiced by the upper castes will become more clear to you when I describe the opposite of dowry, sort of the opposite, okay? That's called bride price. So bride price is practiced by non-Hindus, lower caste Hindus, tribals. Originally, I mean, this, this is all changing. That's part of the argument. What is a bride price? So the woman goes to the male fam male, right, to her husband's family, that's in the same direction, except here's the difference now. If you look at the board here, the, it's the man's family that is actually giving things to the woman, okay? It's the other way around now. It's not her family, it's the male and his family that has to give the equivalent of what we would call the dowry. Among Muslims, you have, by the way, a practice which is called mihir, mihir. So when a woman gets married in, in, in uh, Muslim society, as a Muslim woman, when she gets married, the, the judge who is conducting the nikah, nikah is the marriage, or the kazi here, will stipulate the meher. It has to be stipulated. What is a meher? Meher is, is an amount of money that is given, okay, to the woman, the bride, by her husband and her husband's family. And it's set aside for her protection. That's called the mehir. So, for example, in the event of a divorce, she may need that money, the mehir. That's where the mehir will come in. Okay? And so you can think of the bride pri price and the mehir as separate from the dowry. Okay? Okay, so this is the pattern. And we're saying that bride price was, in fact, the norm among non-Hindus, low-caste Hindus, and tribals, which means what? The majority of India... India's population. Think of it this way, okay? The bulk of India's population. Over the last hundred years, we have seen that more and more societies, communities, groups of people that used to practice bride price are now beginning to practice dowry. That's the big change. What does it mean? Why is that taking place? So in other words, we are now saying one thing, and we're going to add a couple of things to that. We're saying that the practice of dowry was formerly confined to the upper castes for the most part, okay, and was therefore not that widespread. But in the last 50, 60 years, particularly the last 30, 40 years, we're seeing a trend whereby more and more communities that used to practice bride price have now given a bride, bride price and are now starting to practice the institution of dowry. 
Okay? And the institution of dowry creates all kinds of problems. You can see why they create a lot of problems. Very simple illustration. You've got a, per you've got a family, and they give birth to three daughters. For each daughter that they have to get married off, they have to provide a dowry. Right? Okay? They have to provide a dowry for each girl. So there were, used to be ads all over India before it became illegal. I'm really serious about this. Okay? What would the ad say? It would say, save 200 rupees now. Uh, sorry, spend 200 rupees now, save 50,000 rupees later. You know what that means? So this ad would be placed outside a doctor's clinic. And outside a doctor's clinic, because it meant that a married woman would go to that doctor's clinic where they perform amniocentesis. Amniocentesis, as I'm sure all of you know, is a test that is used to determine the sex of the fetus. So if this child was a female, if the fetus was female, the woman would abort it. That's, she's spending 200 rupees to do it. And she's being encouraged to do it because she's being told, right, if she doesn't do it now, then she'll have to spend 50,000 rupees later on because that's the cost of not only raising the girl, but the cost of the dowry. A lot of indebtedness in families is related to dowry problems, right? You, the larger the number of girls, the larger the problem you have because more the dowry you have to give. And you might say, well, why should that be a problem? Because after all, dowry is all these things that a woman needs to set up the house. It's just, dowry itself has now changed. It has changed enormously. So for example, if you are a Harvard MBA, let's take the creamy layer here, okay? You're a Harvard MBA, you're an Indian, Harvard MBA, and you go back to India, you can exact demand a phenomenal dowry, phenomenal dowry, because you, you can command the price. You, you're credentialed, right? I mean, if you were, you know, the father of a girl and your occupation was repairing shoes, you're not going to be able to get a bridegroom for the girl who's going to say, I want a Mercedes for the dowry, right? No. So the dowry you get depends on Okay, the bridegroom, right? That is that the bridegroom is educated, well off, maybe not even educated, but just really well off, right? So this bridegroom says, I'm only going to marry a girl who is going to give me a dowry of $1 million or whatever the equivalent amount in rupees, right? Or who's going to give me a Mercedes and two horses, you know, uh, Arabic, uh, Arabian stallions, you know, or a private jet or a house with a, you know, pool or spa, you name it, whatever. I mean, it's gone absurd, but it has happened. It has happened. Yeah. Sorry? Okay, look, there are, se there are several things that one would have to keep in mind. What I'm, let me just finish, see, if, let me finish the analysis here and then see if the question is answered or not, okay? All right. We're saying, what, number one, that Bride price was more common. It's now changed increasingly. I'm not saying that all communities have abandoned it, but many of them have. It's engaged, increasingly changed to dowry. Number two, dowry itself is no longer given in what you might describe as modest measurable units, if I may put it this way. Okay? There's no limit. There's no limit, basically, to what can be done. Number three, by the way, all of this is illegal. That is, the giving and taking of dowry is prohibited by the Prohibition of Dowry Act of 1973. There's, a, there's an act. India has the most progressive legislation in the world, believe me. I, any issue you can think of, almost, except pertaining to a few small areas such as homosexual rights, you know. In virtually every area you can think of, India has the most progressive legislation, right? So 1973 Act says prohibition, of dowry act, which, and not just taking, but giving of dowry too, right? All of this is strictly illegal. And they have done surveys in cities such as Kolkata, Delhi, Mumbai, where they found that about 5% of the people knew of such an act, okay? So you might say, well, this has to, you know, maybe the problem would get better, you know, or we wouldn't have such an acute problem if more people were informed about you know, the act. Well, I think, in fact, actually, you know, this survey was done 20 years ago. I think there's a substantial number of people who know, okay, 
that the giving and taking of dowry is illegal, right? So it, this is again a similar problem to the one that we talked about when we talked about the Dalits, that when the legislation is imposed from the top, people get resistant to it, right? They get resistant to it because they would rather be told in other ways and try to be educated in other ways that maybe there is something about the institution of dowry, okay, that is wrong. But then if you talk to people such as women of my mother's generation, and many of them say, we don't see what's wrong with dowry because, and you can see why they're saying that because in their time, the dowry actually was something that was used to assist in setting up the house, right? So the transformations that have taken place within the practice and institution of dowry are something that they are not really comprehending or not coming to terms with, okay? Now let's try to unravel this a little bit more and then we'll get back to dowry murders. Okay, we'll get back to dowry murders because we still need to unravel a little bit more about, right? We'd have to say, all right, we have not answered the question why all of this is changing. We've simply registered the fact that it's changed. Okay, so more families went into dowry, gave a bright practice. Okay, why, what might be some of the reasons? So let me give you three or four. There are about 10 or 15, but I'm gonna give you three or four, right? One is something that I'd actually written on the board the other day because I had expected to get to this issue, I never did. Sanskritization. Okay, what does Sanskritization mean? I'll give you a very simple illustration of what Sanskritization means. Let me first define it. Sanskritization is a form of upward mobility. It's a form of upward mobility. It's a, it's a way of registering your success, your movement across a lower strata into a higher strata of society, okay? And how does it take place? The upper caste, for example, the Brahmins are more likely to be vegetarians. That doesn't mean all Brahmins are vegetarians. Please don't interpret me to mean that, you know. Uh, Kashmiri Pandits love meat, for example, you know, and they're Brahmins, okay? But Brahmins are more likely to be vegetarians and there are going to be many vegetarian Brahmin communities. Now in a certain area, what happens? Certain area, a person who is lower caste comes into money. And this is now related to the caste issues that we were talking about, right? Okay, so comes into money. And remember there was this whole question of, okay, you can come into money, you can become the upper class, but will you ever be accepted in that upper class? You will not be accepted until you start giving up some of the habits that people think belong to the lower caste from which you came. So you come from a lower caste, and you know, the lower down you are, the fewer the taboos. That's one of the few privileges of being, one of the few privileges of being lower caste. There are very few taboos. You can eat and drink anything like crazy because you can't get contaminated. You're already impure, according to the Brahmins. So how the hell could you get contaminated, right? You just eat whatever you want, drink whatever you are to excess if you want, right? Now the lower castes are all meat eaters, meat, fish, everything. The Brahmins, absolutely not. That is among the vegetarian Brahmins. I mean, that's just absolute taboo. So what do the lower caste, a lower caste person who comes into money will stop eating meat. How unfortunate, right? You could say, right? Giving up one pleasure of life, right? Or will stop drinking alcohol because there may be a Brahmin community there which observes a strict taboo on the consumption of alcohol, right? You see what I'm saying? This is called Sanskritization when you start emulating. It's from the word Sanskrit because Sanskrit was the language of the Brahmin elites, right? So the word Sanskritization is from that word. Now, what is the relationship between that and what we're talking about? When you move from bride price to dowry, you are Sanskritizing because dowry is a practice adopted by the Brahmins. You come into, you want to attain the status of an upper caste person. You want to have the respect of that person. You Sanskritize. So you say, I'm going to give a bright, bright price 
in my family, we are not going to have bright price anymore. We're going to start having dowry, right? And the reason why, by the way, why the Brahmins did not like bright price, because remember that, okay, the woman is going, but then the man's family is paying money or goods, equivalent of money, right? The Brahmins thought that this was basically equivalent to buying a woman. So there they had their own logic. They said, if, you know, if, if the man is paying for the bride, in effect, he's paying for the bride, you know, because he's giving goods or money, that means he's buying the woman, right? And they thought that was degrading and demeaning. That's, that's one reason why they did not practice bride price and they practiced dowry, okay? So you, you see now how entangled the web, we've only looked at one reason here that we're talking about in order to understand what is really going on in this particular practice here. Okay, that there's been this shift and now we're starting to give reasons for why this shift is taking place. Okay, the second thing has to do with the fact that modernity, when it comes in, creates new sets of circumstances, new sets of expectations. Okay, it upsets the conventional social order that had existed in these societies. And I have a feeling that some of these problems are problems that are particularly apparent in societies which are undergoing rapid transformation, rapid transformation of social norms, social order, expectations. And one of the things that you had here was you had the phrases actually taken from American studies about America, because that's what you had here, the revolution of rising expectations it was called, right? One thing that America went through, the West went through, is a revolution of rising expectations. More and more people come to expect more. Not just more rights, but more entitlements. 50 years ago, or 75 years ago, you had a car, not everybody would have expected that they should have one too. Now, it's a common entitlement. Right? Very simple illustration. And the re this revolution of rising expectation has to do also with consumer goods which are much more transparent, palpable, vi visible. You go into the next door neighbor's house and you have a neighbor who's got a Sony color television and you've got a 10 inch Zenith black and white television, you feel the pinch, right? And then you find out where did this person acquire this television? Through a dowry, right? So we are saying, we've added two new things. One, that the traditional restraints and limits that were placed on this institution of dowry, those began to disappear. I mean, some families still observe them. Some families still observe them. You know, I mean, obviously most, a lot of the people that I know, uh, you know, it's not like when they got married, you know, the, the, the women that I've, Indian women I've known for years, some of them old friends, it's not like everybody who got married, you know, that, they, that the, their groom, that their husband-to-be you know, first said, well, hey, what are you going to give me for dowry, Sunita, before I get married to you, right? That's not, obviously, it doesn't work that way in all families, but we're saying the practice is widespread enough, okay? Widespread enough. So you've got this revolution of rising expectations, and you have this, the point I began with, the elimination of the kinds of constraints that people had accepted themselves, okay? There are many other things. Let me add one last thing to that picture, okay? And it's not going to complete the picture, but it's going to give you some idea of what, why these changes have taken place. In many of these families, um, it was, the, okay, let me, let, me, let me backtrack. One way to understand this is to look at the economics of it, okay? This is where we have to now look at some hard-grained economic analysis of what this institution amounts to. So a man gets married, and he uh, marries a woman, and let's say this man is, that example I picked, the Harvard MBA, or let's say somebody who's relatively affluent, okay, relatively affluent, or at least if not affluent, the more important consideration even be, not even affluent here, but somebody who is well-educated, but perhaps not too affluent, but would like to be, okay? So comes from a traditional, typical middle-class family where a lot of emphasis is placed on education in Indian middle-class families, huge emphasis. But there's not much money to go around. And you've got three boys in the family, right? 
So the dowry you get for the first son who's getting married, you use that dowry to send the second son to America for an MBA degree. Okay, that's what you might use the dowry for. Because the dowry here includes money now, right? right? You use that for that, okay? Now in, these, in, in this scenario, what we are saying is that, and this is where the economics come in, comes in, that in many of these families, they do not consider it proper for their women to be working. Okay, it's not proper for their women to be working, or their women need not work, if you want to put it in a different way. You find that, by the way, in, in very upper class families in the US. The women almost never work. If they work, it's all, if I may put it this way, social work. Okay, you know, you're spending five hours at some children's home, you know, or, you know, five hours here or there, you know, famine relief or, you know, um, Katrina relief or whatever. But the women are not in these upper class families, even in the US, very often the women do not work. Okay, so what this person is doing now, he's going to say to himself, the husband or the husband's family is saying, right, it costs me so much amount of money to feed an additional mouth to raise this person, so to speak, to buy her clothes, etc., etc. You do a calculation. You do a rough calculation of sorts. Okay. So there are two factors here. One is that the woman is almost like a trophy, because if the woman is not working in your household, that means you have enough wealth that she doesn't have to work. You see, it's a sign to everybody else. It's like owning a fridge, if I may put it this way. That is really huge. Okay, it's just, it, you're sending a signal to somebody there. So you're saying, you know, I've married a woman and she need not work. Okay, but on the other hand, that's a lot of, you know, bravado. W what if it was costing a fortune for you, right? To meet her demands and her needs and her expectations. And so this is where the dowry comes in. The dowry comes in here. You do a rough calculation, you say, okay, I'm not gonna, I don't want my wife to work. I don't want, want my wife to work, you know. But on the other hand, I'm gonna need so much money in order to be able to maintain my status with her, right? And show this status to everybody else, right? So if there is a kind of a, if I may put it this way, really crass kind of economic calculation that starts to come in. And again, this is relatively recent. Relatively recent. I'm not saying, by the way, because somebody might come legitimately and object, oh, isn't that a romanticized view of India that this never happened before and it's happened? Well, it, no, it's not a romanticized view. I'm not saying that women were always treated fairly and equally. I've never made that claim at all. But I'm saying there are certain problems which we think are age-old problems, which in fact are not age-old at all. And that's why I've gone through the whole history of this institution here, that this is a aspect of modernity. Now this raises fundamentally a big problem for everybody who's interested in women's issues, the issue of reform. That is that we assume that as we move along in time and societies become more modern that the position of women becomes better. That women are more liberal, more emancipated, more economically, you know, independent. Right? I mean, I just, I just came from teaching another class where, uh, where one of the students did a presentation on domestic violence. Right? And what she pointed out, which is widely known to anybody who knows the literature, is that anybody who thinks that domestic violence only takes place in working class families and does not take place in middle class families and educated families, where the women are educated, simply doesn't know how widespread this is that this is domestic violence is across all strata of society. Lower, upper, middle, educated, non-educated. So let's not assume, in other words, that this is a problem which is just another age-old, timeless problem thrown up by India. That yes, there have been problems that have afflicted women, but we are saying that modernity may aggravate some of the problems even if it creates space for women which did not exist before, space to come into the public sphere. And that's where those figures that I gave you, or, or the, the sentence that I gave you, that if you look at the number of women in India who are doctors, scientists, engineers, it's huge, really massive. Uh, I mean, and in fact, I've, I've always found it to be the case that here there's a much stronger taboo 
implicitly on women becoming engineers, for example. You just go to the electrical, the engineering department and find out how many students are women. Okay? Really, really few, minuscule. In India, it's very common. Engineering departments are full of women, just full of women. Okay? Right? So you see, you see that I'm not saying that. Oh, the entire problem has to do with modernity. What I'm saying is that modernity is also a complicated matter. It creates spaces for women. It allows them certain kinds of freedoms. But it's also very clear that modernity has, in some ways, created new forms of encumbrance for women, new forms of obstacles, new forms of oppression, which have become more aggravated. So now we go back to dowry murder. So what is a dowry murder then? So dowry murder takes place when a woman gets married and then the demand after marriage. After marriage. Oh, do you think that your family could give one lakh rupees? Or, you know, do you think you could contribute a Maruti? Maruti is an Indian car, by the way, you know, okay, to the family, you know. Or, you know, the, the husband's family might say, well, they might say to the woman, you know, your brother-in-law, the younger brother of her husband, he wants to go to America to do you know, an MBA at UCLA, do you think that you could, your family could contribute some money? First it begins as a polite request, and then the girl's family says, well, we don't have any money to give, you know. And in any case, w there was this tacit agreement that whatever we gave at marriage, that's it. That's the end of, end of it. And then the pressure begins. The coercion begins. Okay? The coercion begins, and eventually it may lead to the woman being killed. Now you might say, how is that a solution? Anybody wants to tell me how that is a solution? Huh? No more. They don't have to spend money on them anymore. I mean, they're dead. Oh, well, they don't have to spend money on her, but, but if the idea was to get more money, how is killing her a solution? Yeah. Remarry. Remarry. Simple. In many, of, most of these cases, they have found that the husband a year later was remarried to somebody and had gone on a fresh dowry. Absolutely. Right? Do they know? I mean, would they know that? Does who know? The new woman. Does she know that? Oh, well, married and she, well, they're not, I don't think they're going to go advertising loudly in front of that woman that, hey, you know, your predecessor in this position was killed. Okay? <laughs> I mean, I don't think they're going to do that. But she may know because word of mouth, uh, somebody may have warned, but but you see, this is where the family might say, oh, we don't believe that the woman was killed. She, she must have died in that accident. I mean, didn't the newspapers say, she, the family will say that, you know, she was killed while her sari caught fire, right? Remember that these very few of these incidents are described officially as dowry murders. In fact, officially there is no such category called dowry murder. It doesn't exist. A murder is a murder, you know. But then, and, and there's a huge bunch of legislation, by the way, pertaining to this. So, for example, the Indian government passed a law about 15 years ago in the hope that this would radically bring it down. And that law is that whenever a woman dies within seven years of her marriage, within seven years of her marriage, okay, of unnatural causes, that is that she didn't die of typhoid or AIDS or whatever, if she dies of unnatural causes, such as an accident of this kind, an autopsy must be performed and a police case must be opened up. But there are a lot of problems in enforcing that law, huge number of problems. One, the biggest problem is that in Hindu families, right, you burn the dead. And you're supposed to burn the dead within 24 hours. In fact, as soon as possible after death. So before the police can even come in, the woman who is the victim of the dowry murder has already been cremated. The body is gone. What are you going to do the autopsy on? You know, right? So there are all kinds of problems of this kind. I mean, you pass the legislation, it's well-meaning legislation, and, where, oh, and you say you open up a police case. And of course, it, in some cases, the legislation is productive. It's productive because the woman may not die. She might get burns over her body and it might be another month. She might be lingering on in the hospital for a month before she dies. So then they can, they can take her testimony, right? They can take her testimony and then when she dies and they can conduct an autopsy as well, right? So there have been, by the way, convictions 
there have been convictions uh, against uh, uh, under a law which has been passed explicitly to prevent dowry murder. There have been convictions, not a huge number of them, but there have been. But the numbers, at least throughout the late 1980s and the 1990s, were not really going down. Okay, we were still talking about somewhere in the 5,000 range. All right, now, uh, the Shabano case, I'm going to have to take up uh, on, uh, uh, what is it? Today's Thursday, right? Tuesday. I'm going to have to take up on Tuesday, uh, because what I want to do is I want to take three or four minutes to talk to you a little bit about the white tiger, okay? Um, I mean, I would say that most of you did reasonably well. The most of the papers were about darkness and light, you know, if I may put it this way. And I want to ask a question uh, from all of you. Um, when you think of darkness and light, is there something you can think of? I mean, some text that you grew up with? Anything that comes to mind? Heart of Darkness, Conrad. Yeah, but that, but it's more darkness and no light, if I'm going to put it this way. If you see what I mean, right? Where is, what is a key text of Western civilization? You should know it like the back of your hand. Bible. And where in the Bible? Genesis 1. In the beginning, right? Genesis 1. In the beginning, there was creation, right? There was darkness. There was darkness, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God called this light day, and he called the darkness night. I'm quoting you exactly. Genesis 1. Okay? Now you think of darkness and light. The fact that he's using this metaphor clearly indicates as well that the set of problems he is talking about is an age-old set of problems. See, you're all assuming that ah, this is all about modernity only now. But why is it darkness and light? I mean, if you have, it's impossible for me to believe uh, that somebody like Adiga would not have known about this metaphor, you know. I mean, I've known about it, you know, even though I'm not a Christian since at least 17, darkness and light and its place in, the Genesis, in Genesis, okay? So what we're saying is that then immediately that raises a question, okay? What in the analysis is generic and what is particular to India, okay? So you have to let your imagination run. Or the names of the characters, they're all named after animals, right? Does that remind you of something? Somebody should let their imagination run with it. I mean, that's what a novel is. He's letting his imagination run. You let yours run, right? You can't read a novel as though it were a school textbook or a social science textbook. Because I think what's the major problem here had to do with simply reading it in the realistic vein. Okay, this is what it says about poverty, there is darkness, Balram is going to move from darkness to light. This is the nature of the people who live in darkness. There's corruption, there's hypocrisy, et cetera, et cetera, right? But when you get these names, why does he call these characters by these names? Stork, right? Animal Farm. What is Animal Farm about? I mean, if you've read George Orwell, right? Animal Farm was a metaphor for the nature of oppression. There you go. You've got a something you can hook the argument to, right? Think about it. If you really think about it, there are all these things that are going on of this kind. And I'm not saying you have to grab all of them, right? I mean, one student made a very interesting observation. I only found that in one paper, really. And that observation was to the effect that it's very clear that Balram, even though he comes from the darkness, he comes from the village, he comes from the rural area, he is the one who is illiterate, uneducated, right? He is the one who understands globalization much better than Ashok. I think it's true. No question about it. He, I mean, he's savvy enough to understand it, to take advantage of it, to move into that world, right? See, in other words, what is the relationship of globalization to this character? I mean, it's an interesting commentary on the fact that you need not be educated at all to be able to move into that world, you see, right? So that's the sort of thing I think you do when you look at a novel like The White Tiger, I would say, you know? You see the darkness and light, 
but use every you know uh, uh, source that you can think of think of it you know what kind of metaphor is that what does it draw back into where does he get it from i mean it, people don't pull things out of thin air if you're a writer i'm a writer so i know that you have to you don't pull it out of thin air there's always something there some textual tradition literary tradition aesthetic tradition that you pull it out of and then you see how you manipulate that tradition because obviously if he's getting if darkness and light is the dominant metaphor of genesis which is the first book of the old testament okay right right and if if it is then we are saying what is the place of that metaphor as it functions in a novel like this okay so i'm not going to say much more about about the novel i could say a whole lot more but i'm just giving you a few ideas about the sorts of things that you could have done in your analysis okay and so i'll give the papers back to you now